much. We're going to sing about God's holiness today, and uh, we're going to split you up and challenge you a little bit and see if you can pick somebody to follow and follow when we, everything goes wild here, okay? <laughs>
He's in charge here, so <laughs> kind of have to roll it sometimes. Hey, it's nice to see you this morning. This morning we're, uh, we're, we're in this series right now, and we're talking about how the ancient word, how the scriptures, the Bible, speaks into the modern world. And every couple weeks, so we talk about it's, it's a literary genre course. There will be an exam at the end. I hope you've been studying we're talking about the different kinds of literature, the different ways that the Bible communicates to us. And every couple of weeks, we punctuate it with a hot topic. The first hot topic was gender dysphoria, where we talked about how people, how there are two genders, um, but sometimes people get confused or broken in unique ways. And how can we as Christians respond to them in a way that is both true and kind? And then we talked about uh, abortion, you know, and how God is the author uh, and creator of life, and how abortion is a hot topic in the modern world, but we stand for life. And so today we're going to talk about another hot topic, uh, immigration. So this one is pretty hot, all right? So what I'm going to ask you to do, because I'm going to say some things that you like, and just settle down because I'm also going to probably say things that you don't like. So hold your tomatoes, <laughs> hold your cheers, all the way at the end. And what we'll do is after we do this, we'll come back in and we can talk. Um, we're, we're broadcasting on the internet, so I don't want to get you know the NSA involved or you know Homeland Security stopping by. My mom is often listening, so uh, we'll try to be as kind as we can as we talk about this. A couple of announcements as we get started. Um, we're, we're putting together a Saturday night service in conjunction with Rob's Baptist. It will happen here at Pathway, and it's going to be different. Okay. Uh, what we do on Sunday, this is preaching, right? It's, a, it's normally a one-way communication where I talk to you. Now, here at Pathway, it's a little more two ways than at some places. But, um, and that's okay. But what we'd like to do on Saturday night is sort of appeal to younger generations by being more interactive and by using some of the musical talents from Pathway and Rives to put those groups together and sort of take our music up a couple notches, okay? okay. Or maybe down a couple notches, depending on your perspective on church music. Uh, so the, the initial meeting is gonna be uh, November 9th. Um, the other thing I need to announce is we're also working with Rives this week to do what? Trunk or, or treat. That's right. Where we get to just unload candy on the Northwest School District. Um, and probably greater Jackson County, they expect about 1,000 people to come through. So some of you have already signed up for trunks. Uh, if you're still bringing candy in, that's fine. We do still need some candy. With all that said, let's pray together. Father, I thank you so much for what you've given us in your word. I thank you, Lord, that you've given us heavenly citizenship. And so, Father, as we, as we think about immigration today, I pray, Lord, you help us to hold in our minds that we're visitors here. And so help us, Lord, to be kind and honest about the problems we face as a country. But, Lord, help us also to focus on Scripture today. We thank you, Lord, for all that you've done in Christ's name. Christ's name. Christ's name. Christ's name. Christ's name. <clears throat> so, so, where do we start with immigration? Let's start with a guy named Benjamin Franklin, who in 1753 said this, 
The immigrants are generally of the most ignorant, stupid sort of their own nation. Their own clergy have little influence over the people, not being used to liberty. They know not how to make modern, uh, modest use of it. You, you thought that politics in the past was polite and kind and friendly. That's Ben Franklin, and he's talking about immigrants coming into America. But let me ask you this question. How many of you are German? How many of you are Irish? How many of you are Italian? How many of you are French? He's talking about you. And he's talking about me. Because what Benjamin Franklin was very excited about was non-English immigration to the United States. He was concerned that everybody's talking German. And it's got to stop. He's not alone. Alexander Hamilton, also an immigrant himself, said this. The influx of foreigners must, therefore, tend to produce a mixed compound to change and corrupt the national spirit, to complicate and confound public opinion, to introduce foreign tendencies. In the composition of society, the harmony of the ingredients is all important, and whatever tends to a discord and intermixture must have an injurious tendency. Alexander Hamilton, an immigrant himself, is opposed to American immigration. Hamilton thinks immigration is bad. Both Hamilton and Franklin are concerned about the increase in European immigration. He's concerned about us. Us non-English people coming into the country and ruining the whole place. We've been here before. When it comes to the discussion about immigration, when it comes to every perspective that we have, building walls or not building walls, we've had these discussions before as a country. And so we need to be careful to think about this carefully. Immigration is the process by which people and groups of people migrate from one place to another. Usually people are moving from their homeland in search of employment and stability. And this holds true across history. The reason that you're here is that someone in your past was looking for a stable place filled with economic opportunity. There have been three great waves of immigration into the United States. The first wave was from 1820 to 1860 primarily from Germany and Ireland. The Irish potato famine ruined a lot of crops, and so there was this thing called potato blight. And so across Ireland, crops failed, and the people had no food. And they emigrated to a lot of different places, but a lot of them landed here. This created great concern among the United States, among the people of the United States, because the Irish people were of an alternative religion. They were Catholic. And everybody was afraid that the Pope in Italy was going to overwhelm American politics. We've been here before. I think the slide here is, the next one is Pope Alligators. Um, I, I don't know that those fears have come to pass. You know, similar to modern fears about Islamic immigration, if you suggest that, oh, it's different because Catholics and Protestants have always gotten along, um, you need to study a little bit of history, right? In, uh, in the 1870s, there were the Orange Riots in Manhattan where 60 people were killed. The second wave was from 1880 to 1920, was characterized by Italians, Poles, and Russian Jews on the East Coast and Chinese immigrants on the West Coast. Prior to this time period, immigration was more open, and so the U.S. policy shifted to gatekeeping. And a lot of the gatekeeping was intended to exclude undesirables, like you. As a result of changes, uh, and much of this gatekeeping was centered on race. As a result of the changes in U.S. immigration law in the 1960s, we shifted to a system of quotas. We are now in the third great wave of immigration to America, primarily from Hispanic, Spanish-speaking people who come from South and Central America. David Gerber, a historian writing about immigration, says this, 
the social and economic effects of the third wave have been hotly debated. Thanks, Dave. I wasn't sure. And that's where we are now. Our country is in the middle of hot debates about the process and effects of legal and illegal immigration. This is a hot topic because powerful economic and political forces line up on one side or the other. And we live in this unique time where you've been studied more than anything else. People, you know, algorithms and computer software, they know you. Go Google something that you don't intend to buy and see what shows up on your Facebook feed. Right? And so these, these powerful forces want your opinion, they want your vote shifted their direction. And so we as Christians need to be careful what, that we think biblically about this. These economic and political groups want to either promote or prohibit immigration to the United States. From an economic perspective, farmers who use illegal immigrant labor have lower costs and can increase their ability to compete with other farmers. That seems to just be a, uh, a brute fact. It's just out there. You know, how much are we willing to pay for fresh tomatoes? Well, not any more than we already are, right? Legal immigrants are often upper to middle class people, uh, middle to upper class, I'm sorry, middle to upper middle class. People who bring foreign investment dollars into the United States. Well, wouldn't it be great to have somebody just bring money in and unload a truckload? I mean, think about your personal budget. Wouldn't it be great for somebody just to drop a truckload of cash on you? Sure. Well, economically and as a country, we'd appreciate that as well. Politically, the various uh, political parties in the U.S. are very interested in having either immigrants or the children of immigrants become part of their political coalition, increasing their political power. There are powerful economic and political forces that want to manipulate your opinion about immigration. Citing the different legal changes between 1978. So uh, in, the, in the environment, there are these powerful forces. And the government has made several attempts to address the legal challenges. How do we organize immigration in a way that makes sense? Citing the different legal changes between 1978 and 1996, Gerber goes on to say, the contradictory direction of this legislation are evidence of the complexity of the problem that a world on the move has created for lawmakers and law enforcers. In the first decade of the 21st century, neither American political party was willing to directly take on the multiple policy challenges associated with immigration. Debates over public policy continued, but the political risks of moving forward in the midst of the polarization of articulate opinion blocks and the anger of much of the general public were rightly construed as enormous. It's a big honking problem because everybody's got a strong, inflexible opinion about what should happen. Immigration is hot, it's hard to figure out, and it's divisive, and it's not easy. It's not as easy as it's being presented to us in the media. I wish it were. And there's always the, the problem of unintended consequences. I, uh, I, I try to be as academic as I can, finding the best resources possible to, to bring information to you about this kind of stuff. One of the studies that I read talked about the increase in consequences for people who cross the border. But one of the unintended consequences of that increased enforcement is that people who used to go over the border and then back, now they just go over the border and don't go back. Well, is that what we want? Those people will make their home here. It's a Christian issue because these powerful forces want to use or misuse the Bible to make their point and influence your opinion. Two of the resources I consulted, uh, I read part of a book by a systematic theologian, someone who should use good resources to make his points. He used a political commentator and an obviously slanted think tank to argue for his position on immigration. At the same time, and from the other perspective, I read a book that ignored information from history and culture to misrepresent a biblical perspective on immigrants and immigration. 
these serious resources commit a logical fallacy called selective use of evidence. Hey, look at this. That solves the whole problem, but ignoring everything else that goes into the discussion. I was a little flabbergasted. When people misuse the Bible or misrepresent the Bible, that just grinds my corn. The best work that I've read so far is The Integration Crisis by James Hoffmeyer. He starts with an understanding of the ancient Near East culture, and he surveys the relevant biblical texts and keywords involved. He makes an important distinction between Hebrew words ger, which the NIV translates foreigner, and nekar, which it probably translates in a similar line. Okay? They both mean someone who is from somewhere else, but a ger has a legal permission to be in the country that they're in. So hold that in your mind. The NIV translates gear as form. Our starting point today is going to be the character of God. And then we'll look at texts which establish God's attitude towards immigrants and end with some practical points. The first point is this, that God has compassion on the outsider. Take a look at Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10 is a very familiar story. <clears throat> it's the parable of the Good Samaritan. When I think about God's compassion for the outsider, when I think about God's attitude towards people, He is very, very compassionate. What's happening in this text is that Jesus is confronted or talk, uh, consulted by a lawyer. So an expert in the Jewish law comes to Jesus and he says uh, he wants to test him. Jesus asks him a question, what's the greatest commandment in the law? And the, the lawyer responds to love God and to love, love your neighbor. But the lawyer is trying to do the minimum. You see, what he's doing as a lawyer, he's saying, who's my neighbor? And he's defining neighbor as narrowly as he can so that he doesn't have to help people. And Jesus knows this. Jesus responds with the parable of the Good Samaritan. It's a familiar story with three main characters. We talked about parables last week. Remember, every main character is intended to communicate a point. Excuse me. And so let's take a look at Luke chapter 10, starting in verse 29. Well, you know, go back up to 25. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law? He replied, how do you read it? 27, he answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But Jesus knows he doesn't want to do it. But he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to, Jer to Jericho. When he was attacked by robbers, they stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road. When he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came to where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, when I return... I will reimburse you for any extra expense which you may have. Jesus returns to talking to the lawyer. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Go and do like this. The priest and the Levite are afraid to touch the wounded man for fear that they become impure and unable to perform their duties in the temple. They have a reason for not getting involved. And it's a love God reason. They want to go to the temple. They're on their way to perform their duties. They're, they're doing what they're supposed to do, at least what they think they're supposed to do. The Samaritans demonstrates compassion. Samaritans were regarded as impure by the Jews. They were the descendants of Jews who mixed with non-Jews during the centuries before Christ. He's an outsider. The one you would not expect to help you. The one you would not want help from. 
and he cares for the wounded man, using his own money, providing rest and food so the wounded man can heal. Jesus' final question to the lawyer is, which of these proved to be a neighbor? Obviously, the hated Samaritan, the one who showed mercy. The Good Samaritan mirrors the compassion of God for the man who can't take care of himself. That God is compassionate and desires compassion from us, his people, is an easy idea. It's an easy idea to think that God wants us to be compassionate towards people. But isn't it hard to practice? Isn't it hard to translate that thinking into actually taking the denarii out of your pocket and using them to be compassionate towards people who need compassion? <clears throat> the one who showed him mercy. God wants you to be compassionate to people who are different from you, even from people who are stuck in a compromised legal situation. I read an account this week of a young man <coughs> who was brought to this country illegally when he was five years old. Now, what does a five-year-old have to do with illegal immigration? Does he even know that he's illegal? Does he even know what his documentation is supposed to be? Let me get you my license. He's five. He's five. He's five. He grew up in the United States. When he was 18 years old, he got into a fight. Thirteen years, this is all that he knows. He gets into a fight, appears before the judge, and the judge deports him to Mexico, a place he hasn't lived for 13 years. He's a child. Does he have the legal documents that he needs in Mexico to get a job? How's he going to use a phone in a foreign country to call his parents in the U.S.? I'm not suggesting that his legal status should be ignored. I'm not suggesting that he shouldn't be deported. That's what the government does. What I am suggesting is that the church is supposed to do more. The church is supposed to be the agent of compassion to people who are caught by a system. How could you be compassionate to someone like that? What if he was from Jackson? What if he was from Pathway? The U.S. has been here before. This is the third wave of immigration. We can have a compassionate response to people who are not treated with compassion. The Good Samaritan uses his own resources to help someone in need. And there are ministries geared towards the outreach, counseling, and repatriation of deportees. So, so basically there are Christian groups because the Christian church crosses borders, right? And so there are groups in Mexico or wherever who help resettle and repatriate people who are deported. That's worth considering to support with your personal finances and as a church. Not that we excuse someone's legal status, not that we advocate open borders or anything like that, but that we have actual compassion towards people because that's God's heart in this whole thing. And don't expect the government to be compassionate, folks. That's not their job. That's our job. There are uh, children. Some immigrants send their children across the border unaccompanied. They write an address inside their clothes and send them across the border to meet some relative somewhere in the United States. How do you take care of these kids? There are foster parents. I have some friends who uh, they, they tried to foster um, broken children from the United States and it was very, very difficult. And they started fostering immigrants. So if we're concerned to be compassionate towards people as God wants us to be, volunteer to foster. If you can't volunteer to foster, volunteer to help somebody foster. Volunteer to help with legal expenses. Volunteer to help with babysitting. Right? The one thing that we can change, the one thing that we can do differently is to change our attitude. That we recognize the compassion of God for people who are suffering, whatever the cause, and look for ways to alleviate that suffering. Because when you stand before the Lord, is He going to ask if you voted for the right immigration policy, or is He going to ask you if you demonstrated compassion 
Is he going to pull out the Good Samaritan parable and say, which guy are you? Priest, Levite, or Samaritan? And if we can't change our attitude, then we're exactly like the lawyer to whom Christ directs his parable, trying to limit our responsibility to be compassionate towards other people. The compassion of God applies to everyone. And it's important to consider specific passages that deal with immigration in the Old Testament. So God has compassion on the immigrants. Let's look at Genesis chapter 12, starting in verse 10. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 12 is about Abraham, Abram, and he um, immigrates to Egypt. Take a look at verse 10. Excuse me. <clears throat> I will get over this cold one day. Now there was a famine in the land. And Abram went down to Egypt to live there for a while because the famine was severe. And he was about to enter Egypt. He said to his wife, Sarai, I know what a beautiful woman you are. When the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife. Then they will kill me, but uh, will let you live. Say you are my sister so that I will be treated well for your sake, and my life will be spared because of you. When Abram came to Egypt, the Egyptians saw that Sarai was a very beautiful woman. And when Pharaoh's officials saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh, and she was taken into his palace. He treated Abram well for her sake, and Abram acquired sheep and cattle, male and female donkeys, male and female servants, and camels. But the Lord inflicted serious diseases on Pharaoh and his household because of Abram's wife Sarai. So Pharaoh summoned Abram, what have you done to me? <clears throat> Why didn't you tell me she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister, so that I took her to be my wife? Now then, here is your wife, take her and go. The Hebrew is, here, wife, take, go. Then Pharaoh gave orders about Abram and his, to his men, and they sent him on his way with his wife and everything that he had. Abram is a gare. He is legally coming to Egypt. He stops at the border where they had border forts. Uh, they had walls. And he stops at the border and he has to ask permission to come in legally to reside in Egypt. And so Abram is a Gair, a legal resident. He went there to live for a while because there was famine. Uh, other translations might use the word to sojourn, which is the Hebrew verb, ger, and the noun form is Gair. He went to Egypt to escape this famine. Old Testament scholar James Hoffmeyer cites several Egyptian documents that describe the situation in Egypt. Shepherds like Abram would come to the border. They would beg for permission to enter the country. They'd be given an entry permit telling them how long they could stay and where they could go. The Egyptian border had forts and troops, although it was not always consistently manned. Abraham's status as a gare describes his legal permission to be in the land of Egypt to escape the consequences of, of the famine. And it's interesting to note when he violates social norms. Now, Abram here has really messed up, okay? He has claimed that his wife is his sister. His wife has been taken into Pharaoh's house to join Pharaoh's harem. That's bad, right? And so what's God's opinion about all of this? Abram, what are you doing? And when Pharaoh finds out that she's actually a married woman, he is righteously indignant. He's more upset about it than Abram is. And so he immediately deports him. Get out, right? Abram gets deported. His legal permission to be in the land of Egypt is immediately revoked. The word ger is contrasted with similar words Nekhar and Zar, which mean a non-resident alien. So a Gare has legal permission to be in the land. A Nekhar or a Zar is a foreigner, possibly someone just coming to, uh, for, to visit or for business. The legal resident, the Gare, is a, there on a permanent or semi-permanent basis. And the law of Moses has specific requirements for the nation of Israel to treat immigrants with kindness. And the passages I'm going to give you are only a small sample of how they're supposed to treat resident aliens. The first is Exodus 22, 21. Which is on the screen. 
Exodus 22, 21, do not mistreat or oppress a foreigner, a ger, for you were foreigners, gerim, in Egypt. And the idea is this. Uh, you remember the history of Israel, right? Uh, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, where uh, Jacob is Israel. Joseph is the guy who gets taken down to Egypt, invites his family to come down to escape another famine. They're put in the best part of the land, and over the course of 400 years, they become slaves. Then they are led out of the land by Moses. And as Moses tells them how God's will for them, God's desire for them as people, he says, do not oppress a foreigner because you were foreigners in Egypt. You had legal permission to be there, but you ended up being abused by a, a bad government. So don't have a bad government that abuses legal residents. Here's another one in Leviticus. <clears throat> When a foreigner resides among you in your land, do not mistreat them. The foreigner residing among you must be treated as your native born. Love them as yourself, for you were foreigners in Egypt. I am the Lord your God. That goes further. Not just don't mistreat them, but actually love them. Be loyal and faithful to them. Because they are legal residents inside your community. And what's the hope? of Israel, that they would bring someone from outside to inside so that they can participate in the worship of the one true God, right? There is an overt religious agenda in the nation of Israel. Deuteronomy chapter 10, also on the screen here. For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who shows no partiality and accepts no bribes. He defends the cause of the fatherless and the widow and loves the foreigner residing among you giving them food and clothing. And you are to love those who are foreigners, for you yourselves were foreigners in Egypt. Fear the Lord your God and serve him. Hold fast to him and take your oaths in his name. Not once or twice, not as an aside, but repeatedly, the people of Israel are commanded to treat foreigners with justice and kindness while they are living in the land of Israel. And what Hoffmeyer suggests is these are people who have legal permission to be in the country. My last job was working for a trucking company based out of Egan, Minnesota, a suburb of Minneapolis. There are about 15,000 Somali refugees living in Minnesota, and some of them are truck drivers. Some of them were coming through orientation to the company at the same time I was coming through. Somalis are from Africa. They have dark skin. They practice Islam. Uh, you probably remember the movie Black Hawk Down or news programs from the uh, early 90s um, where a NATO military in Somalia to try and bring stability to the region. At the time, there was no central government, and so they were trying to bring stability and food into the region, <clears throat> and American helicopter pilots were dragged through the streets on the news. The central government was only recently established in Somalia. These Somalis in America are refugees. They have a legal status and legal permission to work in the country. One of the other guys in orientation, you can imagine, folks, uh, truck drivers are known for their tolerant attitudes towards everyone, right? Their love for all humanity and their, their hesitance to state their opinions. <laughs> Absolutely the opposite. And so there was this other guy who struggled to see past the different and the other in the Somalis. He was vocal, racist, and rude behind their backs. Folks, I work for Jesus. I'm not afraid of that. And so I thought, you know what I'm going to do? We're out doing road tests and we're just kind of hanging around. And I'm going to go over and just say hi. Now you know I'm an introvert. Saying hi is tough for me. Somehow it's easier when we're crossing cultures because I, I like to understand and try to understand people. And so I'm like, hey guys. And they're like, what's up? Where are you from? Oh, Somalia. How did you get here? You know what I found? Guys. Guys who just wanted to take care of their families. Guys who wanted the stability that America offers, the opportunity to earn a good income and take care of their families. They're just guys. Yeah, they're different. That doesn't mean that every Somali is a good person. 
That doesn't mean, uh, but what it does mean is without taking the time and effort to get to know them, all we can do is be afraid of the other because they're different. And if the only people they meet are vocal, racist, and rude, then they're going to be afraid of us too. Folks, we're Christians. We're called to be compassionate to everybody. We're called to cross those boundaries. To be sure, there are differences between immigration in, the, in ancient Israel and modern immigration. <clears throat> it was probably easier to be a legal resident in the ancient world than it is now. But the underlying principle in the Bible is one of respect for and fair treatment of the immigrant. We don't have a huge immigrant population in Jackson County. Only 1.6% of people in Jackson County were born outside the country. So it's not a huge issue for us. But it could be. And our attitude changes everything. If we are vocal, rude, and racist, we're wrong. We're called to be compassionate towards others. U.S. immigration is complicated. Immigration courts are overwhelmed. It would take an estimate 19 ye- estimated 19 years to clear the current backlog of immigration court cases. As Christians, we have to use critical thinking and reliable resources to understand the problems associated with legal immigration and the unintended consequences of border actions. The most reliable resources are peer-reviewed journals and books that are written based on peer-reviewed journals. Now, most of us are not going to go seeking peer-reviewed resources. So maybe the best thing that we can do is when something pops up on Facebook, some meme that has one sentence or a tweet that is one sentence long, be skeptical. Ask questions. You know, when when the claim is made, uh, immigrants cross the border and get free education, it's actually not true. There are some colleges that have free programs that do allow immigrants to participate in the free programs. But that doesn't mean that you cross the border and get to go to Harvard or MSU or what's the other one? Michigan State. Where are we again? (laughs) You have to be careful. Be skeptical. The news wants you to keep watching. And it wants you to get mad and start yelling at the television. Refuse. If you must watch, watch one hour a day. And then switch. Watch one channel that's from this side on one day. Watch the other channel from that side on the next day. Watch one hour and then go do something that makes a difference. Rather than sitting at home and just yelling at the television all afternoon. The news wants you to keep watching by manufacturing crisis. The Bible supports secure borders, and legal immigration. If that's all you hear, you're not listening. For the legal immigrant, the Old Testament law establishes the principle of equal justice and fair treatment before the law. There are plenty of questions that are unanswered when it comes to immigration, but I want to close the passage from Philippians. Philippians 3.17-21 says this, For as I have often told you before and now tell you again, even with tears... Many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables Him to bring everything under His control, will transform our lowly bodies so they will be like His glorious body. If your, is your mind set on earthly things? Or are you living according to your biblical citizenship? The earthly things are constantly calling for your attention. The earthly things, whether it's politics or economics or the next great iPhone. iPhones aren't great. Android is much better. That's <laughs> true. You can like and follow your favorite politician. You can get regular updates throughout the day. The earthly things are calling for your attention over and over and over again. But what's your agenda 
as a heavenly citizen. As Jesus shared the parable of the Good Samaritan uh, with the lawyer, he was expanding the man's vision of compassion. Whether it's Benjamin Franklin, whether it's Alexander Hamilton, all those guys have this very narrow vision of who their neighbor is. We need to expand that window so that we can be as compassionate as possible to people who are different. Respect the law, absolutely. Build walls, deport people, whatever, but do it with as much compassion as you can. Let the government do government stuff. You be the church. Go further than the government. Because that's what God calls you to do and to be. What's your agenda as a citizen of heaven? The lawyer wanted to limit his neighbor to people like himself, to the right people. Like the priest and Levite, the lawyer has good reasons to refuse to help people in need. We have good reasons as a country to limit access to the U.S. through immigration. But we've been here before. We've been afraid of the German. We locked up the Japanese. What's the most compassionate thing that you can do to the people around you? Let's make sure the good reasons that we limit immigration are actual reasons and not just fears and manipulation. Above all, let's act as though we are citizens of a different kingdom. The character of your person, the character of your community is called to be different from the world around you. You are to be so full of compassion that when someone walks in, they say, wow, those people are different. So be different. Be the right people. As I said, I'll come back in and, and you can ask questions and we can talk more about it. <clears throat> you can ask specific things. We can talk politics. Um, I don't do that in the pulpit. We can do that privately. You can come out on Wednesday and we can talk more. But before we do that, let's pray. Lord God, increase my Overwhelm my heart for people who are hurting and broken. Lord, our immigration system is
given us access. And Lord, you um, you called us to be a compassionate people. And Lord, I ask that you would help each of us in our daily walks as we're confronted with these hot topics to remember first where our citizenship is, to remember that every single person that we see is made in the image of God, and to give them that dignity and the respect that you gave them. Help us to be your church in the world around us, Father. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you, folks. Have a great day.